So we finished our last video with a talk on JC virus. Remember that's the virus that caused encephalitis and also caused demyelination. It broke down myelin. And in this video, we're gonna talk all about demyelinating diseases. These are things that break down myelin. So demyelinating. Just a recap of anatomy, our functional unit of the nervous system is your neurons. And your neurons look kind of like this. So they have these projection calls, called dendrites that receive information, process it in your cell body, your nucleus, and then transmits that signal down the axon and out your axon terminal. Correct? And we said your axon is surrounded by this sheath called myelin. This myelin lets that transmission go quicker, go further. And so if you break down this myelin, then you have disrupted neural signaling or sometimes no neural signaling. So this causes disrupted or loss altogether of neural signaling. And this will be the topic of this video, demyelinating diseases. So we talked about our JC virus, that's your John Cunningham virus or your polyoma virus. We said they cause demyelination. And you can see that demyelination on MRI. You're gonna see this diffuse white lesion. They sometimes call it non-ring enhancing. What does non-ring enhancing mean? Ring enhancing means there's a, there's a white ring around the lesion. All right, so in here, because it's non-ring enhancing, it's kind of just this diffuse, not well circumscribed lesion. That is your non-ring enhancing lesion. And like I said, the polo, polyoma virus affects about 7 to 90% of people, but it will reactivate if you're immunocompromised or if you have HIV, etc. They might instead call it its proper name. When it affects the brain, it's called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. That's quite a mouthful. Progressive because it's progressive, multifocal because it can affect multiple parts of your brain. Leuko meaning white encephalopathy. So you see these multifocal white lesions causing neurodegeneration, demyelination, and that is polyoma virus. You can have other viruses that can cause demyelinating diseases. One of them is measles. Is that right, measles? Usually doesn't occur in your initial insult, usually occurs later when you're a teenager. So if you have measles as a kid and you seem like you recovered and then unfortunately later you realize you're not out of the woods, you start showing these signs of deficits. So you might have dementia, ataxia, focal losses, and it's quite rapid. And these people usually fall into a comatose state and then die. So it's a complication of measles. And if you do a biopsy, you'll see that in the neurons or the things that make myelin, what are the cells that make myelin? For the CNS, that'd be your, you see oligodendrocytes, you'd be right. And your PNS, that'd be your Schwann cells. So in your neurons or the things that make the myelin, AKA your oligo or your Schwann, you'll see these viral inclusions. It would make sense. You would see the actual virus. So you'll see these viral inclusions. And that's just a dead giveaway. Okay, what's the fancy word for this? If polyoma virus has a fancy term for it, we have a fancy term for this too. And that is gonna be subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. It's, infl it's the inflammation of your brain. And I said it's rapidly progressive, so that's the subacute part. That's measles. Some other things that can cause demyelination, especially in your brain. Lysosomal storage diseases. I talked about this in our biochem block. All right, so lysosomal, lysosomal storage diseases, these are things like Niemann pig, these are things like taste sacs. You have a problem with lysosomal storage and then the cells will die and then cause this demyelination. So lysosomal storage diseases can do it. You can have something rare called adreno leukodystrophy. This is an X-linked disorder, which means it shows up more in men. That's kind of code for it. So because it's an inherited disorder, it'll show up early. This is due to a loss of this enzyme called 
coenzyme A. And particularly, this enzyme helps break down very long chain fatty acids. That's quite a name. Very long chain fatty acids are fatty acids that have very long chains. And if you can't break that down because you're missing this enzyme, then those chains will build up in your cells and your cells will die. Why do they call it adrenal leukodystrophy? Because it likes to affect your myelin. That's the leukodystrophy part of it. But it also likes to affect your adrenals. You know, get adrenal insufficiency, so low corticosteroids, low aldosterone, all the all the symptoms that are associated with that. That's the adrenal part of the name. Also affects your testes. There's no testes part of the name. They could, I guess, just add some more syllables in there: adrenal testicular leukodystrophy. But thankfully for us, they don't do that. So questions I've seen on this almost always mention very long chain fatty acids because they just talk about neurodegeneration in young kids there's a million things that cause that adrenal insufficiency uh, again a lot of things that cause that so they almost always mention very long chain fatty acids building up in the cells and then that's kind of tipping you off on this and then they might ask you what's the inheritance pattern x linked okay so that's some ways they can ask that question that i've seen you have osmotic demyelination this is demyelination through osmosis. When you are chronically hyponatremic, and then you correct that really quickly, I'll say quickly correct, your cells can die and cause demyelination. Yeah? Let's just recap osmosis in, in medical terms. Osmosis is a lot more complicated when we're talking about it in a physics term, but for our, we're not physicists. We just, need it for, we just need to know about it kind of really superficially. If you have two compartments filled with water and solutes, one of them has a lot of solutes, this would be highly concentrated. Or I would say high osmolarity. This would be not so concentrated, so let's say low osmolarity. Water will go to the place with high osmolarity to kind of even out that concentration. And then if all the water leaves and goes here, then it's no longer high osmolarity. They become equal. So, so why does fixing hyponatremia cause osmotic demyelination? So if you have your cell, your neuron, and you're hyponatremic, which means there's not a lot of sodium, not a lot of solutes in the outside, then the water will go where there is a lot of solutes. They'll go into your cell, so your cell will swell up. And now things are equal. And if you quickly correct the hypernatremia, and that adds solute to the outside fluid, then the water will want to go to the place where there's more solute. So it'll leave the cell. And it'll leave the cell so fast that your cells will die. And that's what causes the demyelination. It likes to affect the ponds the most. Sometimes we call it central pontine demyelination and the most unfortunate thing is that patients will develop this locked in syndrome where so locked in meaning they they can't move their body they can only kind of move their eyes their brain is still functional but these guys can't move their body so they're locked in their body and it's a, and it's a very unfortunate disorder and it's caused by this okay so the question that's on this sometimes we'll give you the electrolyte panel and they won't tell you the patient's hyponatremic but or in the panel does the patient's sodium would be like 120. And so they're hyponatremic, and then they'll say they came into the hospital and was treated, and then suddenly developed loss of sensation, locked in syndrome. What happened? They were hyponatremic, and the, and the doctor corrected it too quickly. All right, you gotta that slowly correct, and then, then that cell can kind of have time to, to compensate for it. Otherwise, it'll just explode. Hypernatremia doesn't really do this. Hypernatremia causes edema. Por qué? Why is that? Let's draw back our, our cell. Hypernatremia, you have a ton of solutes on the outside, high osmolarity, water will want to go there. So water will start to leave your cell and your cell will shrink. And then if you correct that, if you correct that and you reduce that osmolarity, now it's lower, then the water will go back into your cell and your cell will grow larger until you get cerebral edema. All right, so hypernatremia, you get cerebral edema. Hypo, you get 
osmotic demyelination. These are all things that can cause demyelination in your brain. There's one more, and it's probably the most well-known one. And that is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, no one really knows what causes it, but there's a, a big theory that is autoimmune. So I'll just write MS, autoimmune. It seems that your CD8 cells attack your own myelin. Like many, and like many autoimmune diseases, it's associated with a, a specific serotype of HLA. That would be HLA-DR2. And by having that different stereotype, they think that it causes your cell to not recognize each other. And CD8 attacks your, your neurons, especially the neurons in your CNS, especially the things that make the myelin in your CNS, oligodendrocytes. So these things attack your oligodendrocytes in your neurons and cause demyelination. Demyelinate. And this just disrupts the communication. It really likes the, the area of your brain that's next to your ventricles. So we call it periventricular. Periventricular. It really, really likes your eyes for some reason. And it causes a lot of eye symptoms. One of the most common is optic neuritis, where it affects the nerves of your eyes and your vision just goes out and then comes back. No pain, nothing, just your vision goes out. And it can be scary for some people, as you can imagine. They'll come in, that's a classic sign. Um, a young patient will come in uh, complaining of sudden painless vision loss. And that's, they're kind of cluing you into possible MS. Other things you can see, very classically, so I'll just write optic neuritis. Very classic is INO. We talked about INO, that's inner nuclear ophthalmoplegia. Yeah, do you recall the mechanism of it? Hopefully you do. So I said that INO is classically seen in MS, and the only case I've ever seen of INO in the clinic was a gal of MS. So. Now what's the epidemiology? It is an autoimmune disorder, and those usually affect women more. And there's no exception, so women. And then for some reason or the other, they did data on it. It seems to affect people further away from the equator. Why? No one really knows. No one really knows what caused MS in the first place, so no one really knows why it seems to be further from the equator. So I'll write further from equator. What are some findings? In your CSF, you're gonna find a ton of protein. So increased protein. This is gonna be from the breakdown of myelin, aka myelin basic protein. Myelin basic protein. You can see a ton of IgG. Basically, you're, it's creating antibodies against your, your own myelin. So you can see a ton of IgG. And if you do an electrophoresis and spread that IgG out, you're gonna see We'll just say this section is IgG. You're gonna see a ton of these bands. Yeah, because it's not just one type, we don't call it mono, we call it oligo. We call these oligoclonal bands. And that is classically seen in MS, so no oligoclonal bands. Something else you can see, if you do a nerve conduction study, basically seeing how fast your nerves conduct, it seems to affect your brain more so, if, doesn't seem to affect your peripheries as much, so peripheries will be normal, but like I said, it likes to affect your brain, especially periventricular. So CNS-wise, the nerve conduction is gonna be slower. Sometimes we say slower, sometimes we say increased latency. Two of the same things. It just means it's slower, and it makes sense because it's demyelinated. Myelin is what helps your nerves, nerves conduct faster, so it makes sense it'd be slower. Some more findings you can see on MRI, on imaging, you're gonna see these periventricular plaques, periventricular plaques. So using all of this together, using your clinical skills, using your history taking, using your, your lab findings and your imaging, you can come together and say, okay, this patient has MS. Now, how do we treat MS? Treatment for acute flares, you can give corticos. So all right, flares, corticos. That just kind of dampers your autoimmune attack against itself. For chronic treatment, there are a ton. You're gonna to wanna to use immune modifying agents, again, to damper your autoimmune attack. You can use interferon B. Interferon B is a cytokine. All right, cytokine. And the purpose of interferon B is to kind of regulate pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. And so it kind of brings that back to balance. 
okay? So you're not having too much pro-autoimmune inflammatory attack, so you kind of bring it back to balance. All right, balance, that's, what do I want to say, balance inflammation? Yeah, I think that's good. You have something called glutaramir, and this basically resembles myelin protein, myelin basic protein. So all right, myelin, what, uh, analog? You know what I'm talking about. So as it acts as a dequank and things can attack your glutaramir instead of your actual myelin. And this can tune down inflammation. And it can also turn these attacking T cells, especially things that modulate these Th1 cells, T helper 1 cells, to the more to the more indolent, more helper-like, less inflammatory Th2. So that's how that works. You have mitoxantrone. So mitoxantrone is a topoisomerase inhibitor. Depending on whether or not you've done heme and onc, you know that topoisomerase inhibitor is a chemo drug. It basically stops cells from proliferating. In this case, it'll stop your immune cells from proliferating because they have a really short half-life. They're always proliferating. So this is basically a chemo drug that stops that. You can have natalizumab. I just call it Natalie Zumab. This is a MAB, monoclonal antibody, against Integrin. Integrin is a molecule on your on your leukocytes that help it adhere to your blood vessels that helps it leave. So you, you recall your neutrophils will attach, will slow down, roll, attach to your membrane and then exit out into the site of inflammation. So if you have monoclonal antibodies against things like Integrin and things like adhesion molecules, then it can't adhere and it can't leave. Okay, so you again reduce that inflammation. Now we're not done, but all of these will reduce your inflammation, but also reduces your immune system, which is kind of what we're trying to do. But these things can cause infection as a side effect. In particular, and unfortunately, it can cause your JC virus to reactivate. That was one we talked about in the beginning of the video. And what was the fancy name for that? What did we say that was? We said it was progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So if you got that, then you were paying attention. All right, good job. The last one we're going to talk about is Fingolimid. And Fingolimid is a sphingosine analog. Um, you don't particularly need to know what that does, but if you do want to know, it, it hits a receptor and it causes your leukocytes to stay in the spleen and not leave the spleen. And that's a pretty clever drug. It stays in the spleen, doesn't go to our brain cause these, these attacks. And that is multiple sclerosis, that is pharmacology. These are all demyelinating disorders that like to affect the brain more. Now let's talk about some demyelinating disorders that can affect your spinal cord. The first one we're talking about is B12 deficiency. Then we say B12 deficiency causes neuro deficits. Now you know why. It causes demyelination of your spinal cord. In particular, there are specific, specific areas of your spinal cord. We're gonna talk about that in our spinal cord video, but just know that demyelination of your spinal cord is how it causes neural problems. You can have Guillain Barre. Usually, this is a disorder that follows an infection, and in your body will attack that infection. And possibly because of cellular mimicry, it can affect, it can attack your own body, particularly your nerves, and it can cause nerve damage. So let's say follows infection. In particularly, Campylobacter jejuni. Also, right, molecular mimicry. So it attacks your nerves, and one of the classic signs is symmetrical ascending paralysis. What does that mean? It affects both sides. It's ascending, so it can start on your feet and work its way up. So you can have trouble walking, you might have stumbling. So symmetrical, ascending. You can also have facial deficits, so things like Bell's palsy. So let's say facial deficits. How can you diagnose this? The history is a, is a big clue. So what does Campylobacter Jejuni cause, cause bloody diarrhea. So a patient will come in uh, with 
trouble walking, trouble standing, lots of sensation, and they might say, oh, previous history a week ago had bloody diarrhea. That's Killian Barre. You can also use diagnostic tests to kind of help confirm that diagnosis. You can use your nerve conduction test. What do you think will happen in your peripheral nerves? We'll have slower conduction or increased latency because it's being damaged. Also on CSF, you'll see something peculiar. You might see increased protein from that myelin damage, but you won't see the amount of cells, inflammatory cells that you're suspecting. So I'll just write normal cells. So you see proteins without the cells. So you sometimes call this albuminocytologic dissociation. Albumin because that's the most common protein in your plasma. So basically protein cytologic dissociation, not associated with each other. If they say this term, they're basically talking about Guillain-Barre without actually saying Guillain-Barre. So ways they can just trick you is just using terminology. Another terminology you should be familiar with is there are many subtypes of Guillain-Barre depending on what, what symptoms are showing up, whether or not it's mostly motor, mostly sensory. But the ones we classically think of when we think about Guillain-Barre is gonna be acute, inflammatory, demyelinating, polyradiculopathy. That is a, that is a handful. And people who get a question stem that says this don't know what they're talking about. They're talking about Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre is incredibly easy to recognize on a question stem. All right, so a way they can trick you is just instead of saying Guillain-Barre, they'll say this. All right, and you see this and you get freaked out. It's, it's just the same thing, okay? So acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy, Guillain-Barre. How do you treat it? You can do plasmapheresis to remove any antibodies. You can do IVIG to, again, to kind of damper the antibody effect. And you want to do respiratory support because once it ascends to your diaphragm, once that paralysis ascends to your diaphragm, then you just can stop breathing. So respiratory support is a big one. Next up is Charcot Marie Tooth. Named after the three people that found this disorder. It is a rare inherited disorder, autosomal dominant. It's a group of disorders uh, with a group of defects, but one of the defects is, because we're talking about this in this video, is defective myelin. The patients will show that with things like loss of sensation, motor, all that good stuff. That's pretty non-specific. So some more classical findings is gonna be skeletal deformities. Scoliosis, high arching foot, so, so regular foot kind of looks like this with an arch. A high arching foot, it's basically like this. It's an incredibly high arching foot. We call that pes cavus. They can have hammer toes. The, the feet really likes to be affected. So hammer toes, high arching foot. You're thinking of charcoal marine tooth. Just a few more to round things off. Transverse myelitis. This is inflammation, itis. Mile means spinal, so inflammation of your spine. So transverse, so inflammation throughout your entire spine. Just transverses your entire spine. What can cause this? Everything we just talked about. Every single thing we just talked about in this whole, whole video can cause inflammation in your spine. And, and, and things we didn't talk about, things like trauma. Anything that damages your spine can cause inflammation, can cause autoimmune destruction, can cause demyelination of your spine. So you get transverse myelitis. Nothing really to talk about other than the fact that all these can cause transverse myelitis. And so you have basically this inflammation that goes across your spinal cord. And I want to finish the entire talk with a demyelinating disorder that affects both your spine and your brain. And that's called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Acute being acute, encephalo meaning pertaining to the brain, myel meaning spine, itis meaning inflammation. So acute inflammation of your brain and your spine. Now this, uh, now this disorder is a lot like MS. 
and the fact that it likes the periventricular area. And I'll show up on imaging. However, it's not like MS because it affects younger patients. It's usually younger adolescent or even children. That's right, children. This is from an immune attack following an infection. So follow infection or vaccination. That's not feel for anti-vaxxers, but it is a, a possible complication, very rare complication. So let's talk about a kid that got sick and then starting to have, starting to have these deficits. Or they might say a kid got vaccinated and then starting to deteriorate neurologically. Okay. That is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And those are your demyelinating disorders. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.